Well, good evening, everyone. Um, happy Sabbath, though I know it's not Sabbath for everyone. It's not Sabbath here yet, but we'll be in about an hour. Um, and we're going to be continuing this study on uh, reading A.T. Jones. But um, before we do, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the time that we have here this evening. As the Sabbath hours uh, draw close, we invite your presence into our hearts and lives, that you can continue to teach us, to instruct us, to guide us. We know, Lord, there is much that we do not understand, and um, we are so thankful that you have enabled us to, to be able to understand the things that we have. We know, Lord, that... Um, there is many struggles that we face in this world. And so we pray uh, for all those who are struggling, who are seeking your face and um, we're finding that um, things, obstacles are in their way. We pray that they can persevere and that you can help them and lead them as they need to be led. Help us, Lord, to understand these things um, as we are able, but also to stretch ourselves uh, beyond ourselves, that your Holy Spirit can, can re renovate or rejuvenate our minds, that um, the mess that we have made of our lives, that they can be forgiven, and that you can enable us to do a work in this world. Uh, be with us now. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want, I want to look at this verse here, Hebrews chapter 10. Um, and starting in verse 36. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. Now, this in Hebrews chapter 10 is going to be addressed in Hebrews chapter 11, this idea of receiving the promise. So what, what is the promise that needs to be received in this context? Anybody? What is this promise? Salvation. Okay. Um, now, well, let's look at Hebrews chapter 11. Um, so it's going to talk about here, I'm just going to use this tool because it'll be a little faster to find the verses because I might miss them. So this promise here that Paul is speaking of um, is in Hebrews chapter 9, he mentions it. And, and it says, for this cause, he is a mediator of the New Testament. Um, of course, Christ, uh, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first covenant, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. So what's the promise of in eternal inheritance? I thought that was, uh, that was the, you know, eternal life. Right. So this is this is actually being in heaven, receiving the inheritance in the kingdom of God. Right. Right. OK, so in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 36. For ye have need of patience that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. Right. For yet a little while and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. 
Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. And so this is his preamble to chapter 11. So in chapter 11, it's going to give all these examples of those that had faith, right? And in Hebrews 11, 9, it says, By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise, right? So we can see that this promise here is the land of promise, but it's, it's typical of what is to come. For it says, for he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. So even though he understood there was a land of promise, he wasn't just interested in the land. He was interested in God's eternal kingdom. Uh, Hebrews 11.39 says, after naming all these who had faith, and these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. That is, why are these? Why have these people not received the promise? Why are they not in God's eternal kingdom? Now, of course, when it says these all, the exceptions would be Moses, Enoch, right? Elijah, you know, those are... Abraham? Yeah. Is Abraham up there? No. Not that we no. know. Of. No. We only know of three specifically. Now, it is possible that some of them may have... Because there are people that were resurrected and and went to heaven when Christ was resurrected. Right. And that's when uh, I, I, I kind of used, I not use it, but um, the fact that he used the parable of Abraham in heaven and in, in his bosom, you know, that whole thing. That's what kind of made me gravitate towards that. Yeah, except that's a children's story that. He tell children to make them not be poor. And Jesus turned the story on its head, right? So the Jews did not believe that Abraham was in heaven, right? Because they understood the resurrection is when, uh, you know, at the end of the world, the Pharisees did. The Sadducees didn't even believe in the resurrection. So. Right. <clears throat> but anyway, the point is this promise is received by faith. And, you know, God has this, this purpose, this plan for us. And we get so caught up in the present world that we lose sight of this plan. And, you know, the message that we're going to read here from the General Conference Bulletin in 1895 is going to be addressing um, this idea, what this means. There's some pretty powerful verses that uh, Jones looks at. But, you know, I just wanted to, because I've been thinking about it quite a bit, why is it that we end up becoming discouraged? Why do people leave the movement? Why do people leave the church or leave Christianity or leave, like, leave Christ altogether? And, um, you know, we're, we're focused upon this world instead of upon what God has promised. And, and we, we talk about this message, you know, Habakkuk's two tables and, um, you know, Habakkuk chapter two, right? But the just shall live by faith. But it's so difficult to exercise faith um, when we're not focused upon God. We're focused upon all kinds of things. And the people that have fallen away in this movement not that I know people's hearts, but I could see that they became discouraged. And that happened to Jones. Jones became discouraged. So even though he's talking about this faith, in 1895, he's beginning to fight against a tide or current that is existing in the church that brings about his discouragement. The church becomes very political. People are focused upon the things of this world. They're definitely 
the majority of Adventists, the vast majority of Adventists, even in that time, were not converted. If you read the testimonies, Ellen White is very critical of the spiritual condition of our schools, of the parents, um, of the teachers. That basically people are worldly and that's no different then than it is today. Now we can say, well, the world. Yeah, she's worse. not talking about me. Yeah, well, we can say the world's worse today, right? Um, and in some ways, it is. But you know, sin is much more open. But it was always there. It's not like you know when we think about the past, we think about all these nice Christian people and you know the early Adventist pioneers and how wonderful they were and and godly and so forth. And you can see there were some definitely godly people in the past but the vast majority of people are not godly that is you know they have no reverence for god no real fear of god they can sin openly and because the world accepts it we see it see in the past it was hard to sin openly because you know you would be criticized by the world and so you have to keep up an image but now you can sin openly and nobody cares. So all it does is reveal what's really always been in the heart. And of course, Ellen White could see through that, right? Because of being a prophet, God giving her those visions and the counsels that, that she gave in the testimonies to individuals and describing their spiritual condition. So the world's really, I mean, it's open sin, open rebellion. Um, then it wasn't so open, but it was still there. So anyway, we're going to start reading Joan's first sermon. And uh, uh, hopefully this is a blessing to everyone. We all understand very well, no doubt, that every lesson that will be given will be on the third angel's message. It matters not by whom it may be given. But there has been assigned to me that particular phase of the third angel's message that relates especially to the prophecies of the beast and his image and the work they are to do. We shall begin with that tonight and follow it up as the lessons may come. All that I shall attempt to do in this lesson will be merely to state the case, um, to present the evidence, the arguments will come afterward upon the evidence of the case as stated. In the, in the time we shall have this evening, the case cannot be fully stated fully, only the case as relates to the side occupied by the image of the beast. The next lesson, we will have to consider the case as developed in respect to the papacy, the beast itself. I need not undertake to give a definition in detail of what the image of the beast is. We all know well that it is the church power using the government, the civil power for church purposes. That is definite enough to recall to the minds of all the general subject. The case may be presented this evening. The case to be presented this evening will be simply the outline of what the professed Protestants of the country are doing. And the evidence that they are doing it in such a way that all may see the situation as it now stands before the country. And not only stands temporarily, but stands before the country in such a way that it is intended by those who are conducting the measures to be permanent. The year 1894 alone, we will touch. About the middle of the year, there was a Cedarquist case, which arose in the regular army at Omaha. Cedarquist had refused to fire at targets on Sunday. He was court-martialed for disobedience of orders and sentenced to a term of six months imprisonment, I believe. And we are not to touch upon the merits of the case as it arose in the army. We are to notice the use that was made of it at the time. With this, no doubt, a good many are familiar, but I I simply call attention to it now as one of the points in the general array of evidence that is before us. As soon as that was done and the proceedings had been published, 
the secretary and general manager of the Sunday League of America, Reverend Edward Thompson of Columbus, Ohio, sent a communication to the President of the United States, a part of which the material, material portion I will read. This is from the Sunday Reform Leaflets, Volume 1, Number 8, September 1894. Office of the Sunday League of America, Columbus, Ohio, July 21st, 1891. To His Excellency Grover Cleveland. Now, I want you to draw attention, of course, to this date there, July 21. I mean, we know that's the symbol for midnight. You said 1891. It's 1894. 1894. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. July 21, 1894. Pardon me. Yeah. I was thinking back at the one I just read. <laughs> so, um, so this date, July 21, we know the symbol that it is. And we know that uh, Jones had declared that in the 1893 General Conference Bulletin that the mighty angel of Revelation 18 came down. That's 9 11, right? And we see here what he was talking about. We see a formalization of that message, which we would call midnight here, symbolized in this letter's date. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. To His Excellency Grover Cleveland, President of the United States and Commander in Chief of the United States Army. Distinguished sir, please permit me in the name of over 100,000 voters of the United States, whom I have the honor to represent officially, to petition your excellency for the pardon of Private Charles O. Cedarquist of Company C, uh, Second Infantry, United States Army, who is now, we learn, imprisoned at hard labor in Omaha under sentence of two months with a required attachment to the penalty of imprisonment at hard labor that he pay a forfeiture of $10 per month out of his monthly pay. The reason that we ask for this pardon is that Cedarquist was punished because he refused to engage in target practice on Sunday and that he refused on the grounds that the said target practice was in violation of the laws of Nebraska, where he was, in violation of his personal religious convictions, in violation of the principles of Christian civilization and of the laws of nearly every state in the Union since the Supreme Court of the United States decided in the Holy Trinity case on the 29th of February, 1892, that this is a Christian nation and said private Cedarquist had the right to expect that no regulations or requirements would be made in the army of this nation out of harmony with the general laws and customs of that type of Christianity, which our history has illustrated. Then he refers to the Constitution. Um, so this is Jones, so that part wasn't in quotes. So he, he refers to the Constitution and exemption of Sunday from the time of which the president has to sign a bill. The result was that the man was pardoned and the officer who ordered Cedarquist to do the shooting on Sunday was ordered to be court-martialed, but his fellow officers acquitted him. That shows that the combination was represented in that particular form of organization, has used the governments for its purposes and proposes to do it upon the strength of over 100,000 voters of the United States, whom the general manner has the honor to represent officially. Not far from that same time, the postmaster of Chicago, who is a United States officer, proposed to hold an inspection of mail carriers in the city of Chicago on Sunday, and the directions were given that whosoever among them had any conscientious convictions against such work or service on Sunday were at liberty not to appear. But the parade was not allowed to be held at all because the churches of Chicago combined and sent such a protest to Washington, the president and his cabinet, that the postmaster was forbidden to hold his parade on Sunday. Likewise, there had been before the country for two or three years, the campaign headed by Dr. Parkhurst of New York City against the municipal management. It culminated in the election last November in which this political reform element triumphed. And that triumph spread the fame and influence of the leader of that movement through the nation and other cities that had formerly followed the same course which he was conducting in New York City and since have since invited him 
uh, to come to their cities to give instruction on how to best carry on their campaign in the same line of things. Chicago is the first one that has done this since election. About two years ago, the city of Washington, with some of the United States senators, invited him down there, and he went and made several speeches to teach them how to conduct government. The other day, he was in Chicago at the invitation of a certain club of that city, and I have his speech here, and I will make a few quotations from it, merely to illustrate the actuating spirit of that movement that you may see precisely what it is that it is not intended to be political only, but religio-political. It is intended to be the church interfering. No, not simply interfering, but managing, controlling, and guiding the government by her dictation, and according to her interpretation of morality, of the scriptures, and as it is said, of the Ten Commandments. The one thing that you will notice too, as I shall read these evidences, not only from this speech, but from others that I shall bring, is the prominence that is being given to the Ten Commandments. Now, our work from the beginning has been to set forth the integrity of the Ten Commandments and to insist upon them. And we have expected that the issue upon the Ten Commandments would become national sometime. And one of the points in the evidence that I am to set before you now is that the time is very nearly, if not entirely here, when the Ten Commandments are to be made a general question, a question for general discussion, and that they are to have a place in national affairs. It is true that on the part of these political religionists, the Ten Commandments are to be put before the nation in a false light, and a false use is made of them all the time, but that matters not. When the enemy sets up the Ten Commandments and makes a false use of them and perverts them, it simply gives the Lord's truth and his cause that much more leverage to insist on them as God gave them and as they mean. And that simply opens the way for the third angel's message to have a larger place and to do more work than otherwise. So that, that in all these things, we need not look at that side as really opposed to the third angel's message. They intended it so, of course. But as I remarked once before in your presence, I think all that is all that is merely the other side of the message, but it is all working together to help forward the message. I will read three or four statements that were made by Dr. Parkhurst in his speech in Chicago that you may see the character of the procedure as he is the grand representative of it, that you may see what kind of sentiments are made prominent and what are the representative sentiments of the movement. Here's one of his expressions. Damnable, damnable, damnable pack of administrative bloodhounds. Another is a lying, perjured, rum-soaked, and libidian. I don't know what that word is. Libidianous lot. Another is purgatory to politicians and chronic crucifixion to bosses. Another, thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. These are ethical chestnuts. But they are laid out. Tamini, out Tamini. I don't know what that means. And all this, not in the heat of an earnest, spontaneous discussion, but in a cold, deliberate essay written out in the study and there read from manuscript. Tammany. So, Tammany. What's as, that? Tammany, as you're seeing it there. Yeah. Referring to Tammany Hall in New York, the center of, at that time, the very liberal politicians. Okay. Yeah, I don't quite understand all this uh, language here. Uh, I guess it's colorful language. It's, so, it's language that you would, have, you would have seen in the 1880s and 1890s. Yeah. And, and it's meant to be colorful, right? Yes. Right. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay, so he read from this manuscript these types of things that he had written out. Okay, another series of expressions will help to illustrate this thing. I, I read these from his speech as published in the Chicago Inter-Ocean of January 24, 1895. 
It is not well to discourage people, but it is always wholesome to face the entire situation. To use an illustration that I have used a great many times at home, and in order to accomplish anything that is really worth the pains it takes to accomplish it, you will have to regenerate your city. The word is a quotation from Presbyterian theology, but answers the purpose well, even if it is. And since all this course has been endorsed by the Presbytery of New York as a Presbytery, and as the means of endorsing of him and approving of his course as a Presbytery, it is all Presbyterian theology, according to the phase of it, as held by the Presbytery of New York. So it is with double emphasis that he can quote from Presbyterian theology as held by the Presbytery of New York, at least. It means more than reformation. Reformation denotes a change, um, illegible and only. Regeneration denotes a change of heart, the inauguration of a new quality of municipal motives and impulses. If you say this is dealing with the ideal, of course it is dealing with the ideal. What do you propose to deal with? You are not going to win except by the pressure of splendid enthusiasm. And you'll start no popular enthusiasm by any effort that you make to achieve half measures, right? So this is again, a quote, another series of expressions. I wonder how many there are in this city that are willing to take their coats off and keep them off until they die or Chicago is redeemed. That is what will, that is what will do it. And it is the only thing that will do it. We have to take your life in you will have to take your life in your hands and your comfort and your ease in your hands and conquer victory step by step. There is no call for a dilettante or dude in this work. Reform clubs are numerous and they have large enrollments, but somehow they do not succeed in saving their city. There's no shortcut to municipal salvation. You cannot win it by the prestige or the wealth of the reformed organizations municipal league, civil clubs, or by whatever other name the institution may be distinguished. Um, you will avail nothing except to the degree that you fling your personality and all that it stands for directly against the oncoming tide of evil, even at the risk of being inundated and swamped by it. If this language is more strenuous than fits into your predilections, you have only yourselves to blame for it. For I came here at your building, not my own, your bidding, not my own. If you had any object in life that means more to you than the redemption of Chicago, I would counsel you to keep out of the municipal regeneration business. Jesus Christ said, seek ye first the kingdom of God. This system says, seek ye first of all, have most important of all, the government of cities and the kingdoms of this world. So that's Jones' words there. I wish they would have things in quotation marks. But so Jones is saying, Christ says, seek the first, the kingdom of God. But this movement, this system, is seeking uh, the government of cities and the kingdoms of this world. Jones says, however, I'm simply reading these items now. We will sum them up presently. Again, so another item here. There is no Republican and no Democrat in the Ten Commandments. Our movement, then, has, no, has had no partisanship in it and no sectarianism in it and all around man is bigger than either party and the decalogue is as broad as protestantism catholicism and judaism all placed alongside of each other responsibility need not be taken from the shoulders of the laity but the relations proper to be occupied by the clergy is a crisis like yours here and ours in new york are unparalleled and unique a live preacher if only he get far enough away from his study and his Bible to know the world and what is going on in it, cannot watch the footsteps of the prophet statesman who swung the destiny of the people of Israel 3,000 years ago without feeling the inspiration still who shapes to the man of God is never designed to be employed exclusively in fitting men to get out of the world respectably and to live beautiful, beautifully in the world to come. Beautifically? You got it right. Mean, okay, that must mean like blessedly. Anyway, the Lord's Prayer teaches us to pray, thy will be done on earth. For you, that means first of all, thy will be done in Chicago. And there is no point from 
which such a keynote can be sounded so effectively as from your pulpits. It is encouraging to know that the feeling is growing that Christian fidelity means patriotism just as much as it does. Piety means being a good citizen just as much as it does a good church member. And that near my God to thee and Star Spangled Banner are both Christian hymns in the mouth of an all-round Christian. Jones goes on, he says, I'm simply reading these that you may see the situation and the interest with which these things are being put forth. Um, so he's reading more. The movement with us began in a church, and the appeal all the way through has been to that which the church and the synagogue represent. The strength of the game throughout has been men's responsiveness to the authority of the Ten Commandments. There is no event recorded in the old Bible story that for sanctity would rival uh, for sanctity would rival the enterprise of regenerating Chicago, and no situation in which there was more occasion than here for the ringing out of the voice of some local Elijah, and the more of them the better. The whole question that confronts you just now is a question of righteousness versus iniquity, honesty versus knavery, purity versus, versus filth. And if the clergy can come out in mass and take a direct hand in the duel, what under heaven is the use of having clergy anyway? And Joan says one more. There is a moral leadership that it belongs to the clergy to exercise and that it is wickedly delinquent if it fails to exercise. An appreciation and a vision of the eternal realities that load the instant make out a very large part of the genius of statesmanship. And it is that appreciation precisely that distinguishes the preacher, if so be he is gifted with divine equipment. In the old days of Israel, the statesman was the prophet and the prophet was the statesman. And within certain limits, it even yet lies in the intention of nature and of God that the two offices should coalesce and that the man who knows the secrets of God should shape the moral purposes and inspire the moral counsels and activities of his town and time. And I venture to say on my brethren in the Christian ministry that I speak with the assurance of definite knowledge when I say that there is no influence that will more immediately operate to bring back the world to the church than for the church and its modern prophets to come back to the world and fulfill to it their mission of gentle authority and modern governance. <clears throat> So Joan says, this is enough to set the whole field before you. The terms that relate only to the salvation of the soul in righteousness and are used in the Bible that way and belong only to the church to use that way. These terms are used for worldly things altogether. And the whole of it, the whole plan of salvation and of church work is reduced to the level of this world and made to mean the saving of things as they are in this world. Then you will see the application of the Ten Commandments, which they make, will only be to the outward man. And it will just be just simply the same old iniquity over again. Cleanse the outside of the cup and the platter, and the inside will be as it always has been with the Pharisees. So remember, we started this study reading about those having not received the promise. And that... Um, you know, Paul uh, quoting uh, Habakkuk chap chapter 2, the just shall live by faith. And, and that these all died having not received the promise. That Abraham, he looked for a city whose builder and maker is God. He did not look on the things of this world. Even though he was going to the promised land, he saw the bigger promise. He, he trusted in God. He understood what what god was planning that this was the redemption of the world that this was the everlasting gospel so we can see here that christianity had lost sight of that because when we look at protestantism when protestant protestantism fell in 1844 they become part of babylon what does that mean that Protestantism fell. Babylon has fallen. That Protestants become part of Babylon. What so is your, your question is? 
Well, what is it that they rejected? Why did they fall? What was <laughs> what? They didn't accept the, um, well, they closed the doors to the Millers' rights. Okay. And that was, that was their basic rejection. Okay, so they rejected a prophetic message. But in rejecting that prophetic message, this is the state of Protestantism, you know, 50-some years later, right? Right. Okay. So we can see that, that salvation, understanding righteousness by faith, is tied up in a prophetic message. Agree. Now, the Protestants didn't want Christ to come back. Is that true? They paid lip service to it. Right. Yeah. They had the opportunity. Adventists sometimes give lip service to it still, but many actually aren't interested in Christ returning because they have so many things they want to do now before Christ returns. Well, okay. let, let's also add to that. Mm -hmm. The Protestants of the 1840s, just like the Adventists from 1950, or, or actually since 1919 forward, mm -hmm. do not wish to study in the manner in which our Heavenly Father would have them study. Mm -hmm. The idea of, William, of, of Miller's rules is an antithesis to them because it relies too much upon faith and not enough in their book on the wisdom of man. Yeah, and to understand faith, I mean... You know, I mean, it's one of the most misunderstood words, not just within, you know, the world or within Christianity or Protestantism, but even even in the church and even within this movement. Agree. Right. And, and Jones lays out what it is. Now, we, we talked about the fact that Jones becomes discouraged. That is, even though he had given a message, he's going to take his eyes off of Christ and he's going to look upon the present situation, become discouraged. And that's happened to many people in Adventism, many people in this movement, um, that somehow we lack faith. So just trust that God can take care of the truth himself. Some time ago, you saw the statement published in the Sentinel, which Dr. John L. Scudder of Jersey City, New Jersey, made with reference to the position and work of the Young People's Society of Christian Endeavor. I will read a clause or two from this. I will then call your attention to another statement made within the last week or two from a direct representative of the one of the managers of the Young People's Society of Christian Endeavor movement. First introducing the subject, I read some of the statements made by Dr. Scudder as published in the New York Sun of November 5th, 1894. Now, just before we, we read this, what this reminds me of, what Jones is laying out here, is some of uh, Jeff's notebooks, right? We went through those notebooks, one, two, and three, if you remember that, a couple of years ago. Right. Yep. And, and in those notebooks, Jeff is looking at present statements that are being made, right? He's looking at prophecy happening, you know, looking at what, you know, the Pope is saying and what, you know, the Protestants are saying. You're connecting this with uh, with uh, a repeat? Yes. Now, of course, the notebooks are before 9-11, though some of them uh, are after 9-11. But, um, you know, we can see, though, that Adventists at one time are looking at prophecy being fulfilled around them. But do you think many Adventists would be doing this today, especially our clergy? Are they interested in... in 
the events of the day? No, they're no, they're busy converting people or taking care of the Lord's business in some manner. Yeah, so they they they're entertaining their congregations. They're thinking about the church as being a business to a large degree, right? How do we keep the members in the church? Um, they're focused upon. I always the thought it was how do you get rid of the members? <laughs> how do you make them? How do you make them? Um, you know, evangelistic um, pilgrims. Well, I don't know, but but anyway. So he, he's going to talk about this Young People's Society of Christian Endeavor, what they say. Um, so this is a Dr. Scudder as published in the New York Sun of November 5th, 1894. Almost every church in America has its Young People's Society of Christian Endeavor. And these societies, extending into every hamlet in the land, have declared their intention to enter politics. This is a significant fact when we remember that these organizations number several, several hundred million, million followers and are composed of young people full of energy and enthusiasm. This means that the church is going into politics and is going there to stay. Furthermore, it means that the church is to become a powerful political factor. For in these societies, it is a perfect and permanent organization extending through country, state, and nation and will act as a unit on all great moral questions. I do not take it that the churches are to form a separate political party. On the contrary, they will stand outside all parties, but they will cooperate and as one prodigious organization, make their demands upon existing parties and have their wishes fulfilled. Before the election, every local union will assume temporarily the appearance of a political convention, ratifying such candidates only as will carry out the desires of the respectable portion of the community. They will secure written pledges from the candidates and hold them to their pledges. And if they fail to keep their pledges, those particular politicians will be doomed. I hail with the utmost joy the coming of the eventful day in the history of the church. At last, the politicians will find that we Christian people are not a parcel of fools, that we know enough to cooperate, command several millions of voters, and hurl our combined forces against the enemies of righteousness, law, and order. Now, when Christian people combine and hold an overwhelming balance of power, when they pull together and refuse as a body to vote for any man who will not carry out their principles, then and then only will they be respected and become politically powerful. Why should there not be a Christ, be Christian halls as well as Tammany halls? Right. So those are those liberal halls, whatever they are. What objection to a sanctified caucus? Why not pull wires for the kingdom of God? If sinners stand together and protect their interests, why should not the saints do the same thing and whip old Satan out? Uh, here is the latest. So this is Jones, I believe, again, um, from the Christian Endeavor Department of the Christian Statesman. It's, it is conducted by a Christian Endeavor officer and, and the particular series of lessons that are being taught now and studied is on Christian Endeavor Good citizenship. Uh, just a few sentences from this. The politics of the Christian Endeavor movement is striving for is striving for is Christian politics, and if and is party politics, Christian party politics. We are to conceive of it as a section of Christian living of which of which the social life, the business life, the family duties, and the distinctively church work are other sections, politics as a Christian duty to be thoughtfully considered along with social business and home duties. In politics, Christianity takes exactly similar ground. Of two good candidates, the church has no right to decide between them, but from every pulpit let there thunder tremendous protests against candidates who have the Ten Commandments on the other side. And that may be a misprint for leave the Ten Commandments on the other side, but you get the thought. So just let me see back here. Yeah, leave the Ten Commandments on the other side. Okay. Wherein is a discussion of Christian politics less suitable for the pulpit or prayer meeting than a discussion of Christian business or society or home duties? 
Politics has its peculiar temptations and the Christian spirit is indispensable, if only to save a multitude of young men who enter it every year from moral ruin. We must purify it, but also save the country and our sacred American institution. Um, then what does their salvation teach or reach? Then what does their salvation reach? What only does that salvation from the whole plan of it concern? Only this world, the things of this world. So this is Jones again, right? It does not go beyond that. The minister is to understand if he can get far enough away from his Bible, that is a very appropriate expression, but he is not to work for people getting out of this world in a respectable way and enjoy happiness in another world. He is to work for his own town and his own city, his own state, the nation, to redeem, to save, to regenerate all these. That is the situation further. So he's going to read more again. Christian Democrats will find great duties in voting and the party organization, which are deeper and broader than any details of party movements. With their conservative attitude to all changes, they have an important place in Christian civilization. Let them, like good men and true, study their duty and with faces toward the judgment day fully discharge it. So their fellow Christians in the Republican Party with a different attitude of government policies, yet both alive and to exalted responsibilities, to Christian patriotism and steady moral development of the nation. Here would be an easy and natural union among Christian citizens. <clears throat> the church is the best place for the agitation of moral and spiritual good. And this union in every church of all Christian citizens <coughs> with sections in it of the closer organization of each party would promote thorough efficiency where, where these smaller bodies are most influential, that is, in their own party, leaving out all details of party action or leaving these to the general meeting in a hall convenient of all sections of any designated party. Um, we have good citizenship activity, which every church may wisely assume. This is the on only sort which will accomplish any good. In Christian endeavor, it is a high time more definite plans be pushed. We cannot simply go on giving addresses and holding rallies with nothing practical beyond. On the principles of Christian endeavor and in line with its genius, we urge interpartisan plans. The Christian spirit must have its place in politics and the Ten Commandments and the Sermon on the Mount must rule. <clears throat> so Jones goes on. He says, the Civic Federation of Chicago, modeled after Parkhurst's New York machine, is following the same course that he has as far as they are able, so far as he has followed it in New York. And we have a report from the head of that federation, Reverend Dr. Clark of Chicago. He has written an official report, which was published in the interior. I had a copy of the paper, but it was mislaid. May Maybe we can find it again before we get away from the subject entirely and have some of his statements also. But one of them particularly is on the same line as this. That is, the Christian's relationship to the state, the Christian's relationship to politics, the Christian's role in molding and shaping and reforming the state. And one of the cheap, chiefest principles of politics that he lays down in the platform upon which he stands is the Supreme Court decision of February 29th, 1892, that this is a Christian nation. And as this is a Christian nation, he asks in expectation, what is there for a Christian to do but to work according to that idea and carry out the principles of the Christian nation in a Christian way, shaping and molding it upon the forms of Christianity? Here then are all these elements working all these plans to get control of the law and the lawmaking power. Now, one other sentence from Parkhurst's speech that I left to the last that opens up a field that is worthy of our thinking upon and watching from this day till the end. The questions that are most deeply agitating the public mind this year. So this is Parkhurst, I believe. And that will continue to agitate it probably for many years to come are not national ones, but municipal. We have reached a period that may be designated the Renaissance of the city, the remarkable concentration of population at urban centers, that is city centers, has operated to accentuate, to put an accent upon, to emphasize the municipality. And to such a degree has this concentration reached and so largely our material values and intellectual energies 
actuating all these points that we may almost say that the real life of the nation is lived and throbs itself out in these centers and that the nation is going to be increasingly what our municipalities make it to be, determine it shall be. The argument is this, that such vast concentration of the people into cities, so many large cities are being built up in the country that these cities are holding such a position in the country that they shape the course of the nation. And it no longer lies among the people of the open country outside the cities, but the way the cities go, that is the way the nation goes. And the mold that the cities take, that itself molds the nation. Even leaving out religion altogether, the great cities of the country carry the political tide of the country, whichever way it may turn. Now you see these church leaders understand this and therefore are working to control the cities, thus worming themselves into power there, and then through that to rule the nation. So this paragraph is Jones, right? So he's showing this ar argument. And that's kind of, it's rather interesting. Now, one of the things you see that Ellen White emphasizes about cities is that they need to be worked, right? That the gospel needs to go to the cities. And you can see that because that's the situation at that time is these growth of cities, right? That part in the United States history where all these cities are developing. And that's where the politics is at that time being worked out on a municipal level. <clears throat> Thus you see all the way through Every one of these statements that I've read is simply the statement over again of the system that made the papacy and has characterized the papacy from the first step that was taken by the church in the days of Constantine until now. Anyone that has gone over that history knows that each one of these statements I've read is just exactly the same thing over again. Has anyone here who has gone over the history had any difficulty at all in seeing the image of the papacy? In the situation is laid out here in the statements, which I have read from their own words. No, sir. Anyone who has gone over that history cannot fail to see the image there, working the precise way for the precise purposes that the papacy did. The whole image stands working right before us. <clears throat> so you, you can see that, you know, in 1893, Jones says that the mighty angel of Revelation 18 has come down. And now as he, we're dealing with two years later, he's addressing really the image of the papacy. Then how can any one of us mistake the fact that the image of the beast stands full formed, as it were, before the country today and working with all its insinuating might, not with all the power of the law yet, it is not that fully in its hands yet, but with all its insinuating policy and by all of these encroachments, little by little, taking possession here, working itself in there to get control of that which controls the nation and then mold and shape the nation. Look at another phase in this that shows the image. Those who have read the history of the papacy and its making, the beast and its making, know that the whole contest and all the contests that the papacy had were fought out in the cities, Rome, Alexandria, Constantinople, Antioch, Jerusalem, Carthage, Corinth, the principal cities, were the groundwork and the theater upon, on which the papacy fought her battles and gained control of the Roman Empire and wormed herself in all cases. The country people, I was going to say, they were a secondary consideration, but they were practically of no consideration at all. A country bishop was a very inferior order of being. A city bishop stood much higher. The graduation of the bishopric was according to the graduation of the great cities. And the bishop of the chief city, which was Rome, held the chief power. He could be there and thereby control more of the elements that were needed to build up the power of the papacy. And thus Rome became the seat and its bishopric, the head of the papacy, the beast. Now, do you not see the precise likeness going right over the same ground in this country, trying to secure control of the largest cities, New York, Chicago, Philadelphia, Boston, St. Louis, Cincinnati, San Francisco. All of them have this same thing working. Municipal leagues and the clergy leading, leading in it all, working to control the cities, to get these into their hands and so to control the nation. 
are not the same principles at work here now as were at work in the original making of the beast? Is it possible for us to close our eyes to the fact and fail to see that we are in the presence and the working of that wicked thing? And is it not high time to sound aloud the message of warning against the beast and his image with the loudest voice that the power of God can give? I will read one more statement. This from the Herald of Presbyter of Cincinnati, Cincinnati, January 3rd, 1895. The object, the chief, the grand, the all overtopping object that they propose to use this power for when they get it through the shaping of these municipal governments is shown to be the enforcement of Sunday. The article from which I read is entitled Enforcement of Law. Law is a rule of human action or conduct. Moral law is that perceptive revel revelation of the divine will, which is of perpetual and universal obligation upon all men. It is therefore binding upon the conscience and with the Christian should not require statutory enforcement. But it has developed in process of governing society that all men will not obey the Ten Commandments, which are of universal application and hence it has been found necessary to attach pains and penalties to pro and provide for their enforcement by using the strong arm of civil government. <clears throat> this, as anyone can see, is the very position and teaching and argument of the papacy. So this is Jones again. We shall have occasion to read some other such things when we come to the next phase of this matter in the next lesson. <clears throat> One of the Ten Commandments, which has the commendation of our lawmakers and which has been engrafted on the statutes books of nearly every state, is that which provides for the proper observance of the Sabbath. Our lawmakers thought it necessary to restrain evildoers and those who would violate the sanctity of God's holy day by special prohibitions and penalties for violation of the same. In our city, the open violation of this law has been so continuous and so defiant as to awaken Christian men to a sense of their duty to the state and the Municipal Reform League was organized. Municipal reform, that is city reform, what the Civic Federation in Chicago and the Society of the Prevention of Crime in New York are pledged for. They are the same thing, but are not called by the same name in all the cities. But what caused it to be organized in Cincinnati? Why? The disrespect for Sunday. What in Chicago was the chief thing? Disrespect for Sunday. The first movement was to secure the closing of the theaters on the Sabbath. Um, so I think he's quoting again here. Um, anyway, in this work, the law was sufficient and the police force of the city able to enforce the law. But there was found to be one man more powerful than the law, the police force, or the elements of reform in this city. And that was the mayor. The violators of the law were so numerous that if each one called for a jury, it was impossible to try offenders. The courts were blocked and justice obstructed. The League came to the, chief, the relief of the court with the law at their backs and proposed that the police be instructed to make arrests for persons found in the act of violating the Sabbath law. This would have made the law prohibitory and closed the theaters, even if offenders were not fully punished. The mayor came to the rescue of the theaters and forbade officers to make arrests till after the offense was complete and the entertainment over. The league appealed to the police commissioners on the ground that the police were not bound to obey unlawful orders. A majority of the commissioners decided that the officers must obey all orders of the mayor, and this was necessary to proper discipline. Now then, what are law-abiding citizens to do? They are told that Cincinnati is better governed than any city of its size in the country. And yet Boston, New York, Philadelphia, and Baltimore are able to close their theaters on Sunday. There's some talk of impeachment proceedings against the mayor, while others favor petition to the government, governor to remove the police commissioners and an appeal to the polls on the issue whether the chief magistrate of a city can place his feet on the statutes of God and man and defile the moral sentiment of society. So Jones goes on, he says, so you see, this demands the enforcement of Sunday laws first. If this is not done to their satisfaction, they demand municipal reform. The city is going to ruin. And so you must have a different element to save the city. 
But what would they want to say the city for? Oh, to enforce Sunday laws in order that Sunday may be saved, in order that the nation may be saved. So don't you see the one thing at this last is aimed at in all these movements is everything is the enforcement of Sunday. And we know that that is the making of the image of the beast and the enforcement of the mark of the beast. Therefore, from all this evidence, it is perfectly plain that the country is now in the living presence, the li living active presence of the image of the beast and his endeavor to force the mark. So <clears throat> um, that's the end of that sermon where he's reading all of this that's happening. And so, so if it's true that the mighty angel of Revelation 18 came down in 1892, and Jones is marking this in the 1893 uh, General Conference Bulletin, and now he's saying the image of the beast has been formed. Is he correct on both counts? I'm not sure if I got all the particulars down, but it sounds like it. Yeah, I mean, he's laying it out that way, right? That's what it sounds okay. like to me, that he's laying it out in that manner. Yeah. Okay, William? I would say witness no. I wouldn't think so. He didn't have all the information we do. No, but but in his time... In a typical way, he's laying out the lines like we would. Right? I agree. The mighty angel of Revelation 18 comes down. And the image of the beast is going to be formed. And yeah, and but he, he didn't have a he didn't have a um with okay. I understand what you're saying. I mean, obviously, he doesn't see all the things we see. But you can see that, that he's laying this out, and this is typical. The Jones history is, is typifying our history. Right. He's laid out a line. Okay, right. He's even used dates. Yeah, not that he intentionally used them. But, but, no, they but they, the dates were are in existence in that statement. Yeah, yeah, but wouldn't he wouldn't he have to have a crisis like nine eleven or some um, well, external event that take place during that time? No, for the mighty mm -hmm. revelation eighteen to come down. We know Ellen White endorses what Jones presented. Right. Right. So she refers to it. She refers to to this whole issue, and that's going to be the crisis. Is going to be, you know, it's not it's not you know the buildings of New York falling. It's going to be uh, what happens with the Chicago World's Fair, right? Okay. It's going to be what's happening politically. Now we also have 1888 as well. And 1888, um, you know, in a sense, it's a time of the end, right? I mean, we could even. You know, go back, we could maybe say, you know, it's anyway, it's it's things that precede 9-11, right? So there are events that happen within the church, within that first generation that precede um, the mighty angel of Revelation 18 coming down in, in 1892. So now Jones is marking the image of the beast. So he's showing the progression of events where he says, the mighty angel of Revelation 18 came down, and now we have these events, and this is the image of the beast. I mean, he's pretty clear that we are now in this country is now in the living presence, the living acting presence of the image of the beast and his endeavor to force the mark. Now, we know that the Sunday law did not come, right? Christ didn't come back, all these things. But we can see that this is happening in the United States at that time. Right. right. 
So yeah. history is repeated, but these are typical histories. These are types. Okay. Um, you know, and then he's going to look at the page, papacy next week. We'll read that. Um, so when we look at our history, I mean, we know our history is typical. Jones' history is typical. Our history is typical. When I say our history, I'm talking about this movement, what we've presently been involved in. Now, we know that our movement is looking at a bigger line above us, right? We know that there's the Sunday law that Ellen White talks about. That's still future. But we had the mighty angel of Revelation 18 come down at 9-11. Right? Right. And and then we've taken this line. Jeff has taken this line and he, you know, he put midnight, midnight cry. You know, the image of the beast is going to happen in connection with that history. And then the Sunday law. Right. So, yeah. so as we approach the Sunday law, um, yeah, and Samuel's asking a question, which we'll look at. Um, so, so our history still, we, we actually have a line within a line. As we've understood about the lines, we zoom into a waymark and we have another line. And, and we've been looking for a Sunday law in our time. Like immediately, you know, it's imminent. Uh, but we've come to understand that there are things that have to happen before a Sunday law occurs. That is, our movement has a, um, a responsibility to give a message. And that message hasn't been given. Now, um, Samuel asked the question, did Jones have it in his mind that the mighty angel of Revelation 18 was to come in 1888? Or that he had come? in that year so he seems to mark it as 1892 so 1888 is going to be that first crisis but in 1892 with what happens with the chicago chicago world's fair that's where he's going to say that the mighty angel of revelation 18 has come down right so so we know that this this history that precedes that would be similar to the history that precedes 9-11. And, and maybe you could look at 1888 and 9-11 um, as, as connected in the sense, just like um, the empowerment of the first angel and the arrival of the second. Mm. Maybe that would be one way to understand it. But, 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 yet they, but yet they rejected it in 1888, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that that stopped the where well, it didn't stop it, but it um well that would parallel nine eleven, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, nine eleven as the empowerment of the first angel, not nine eleven right. as the coming of the second angel. Okay. Right? Right. Right. Okay. So yeah, to understand I mean, I don't think it's that important that we nail out all these details of these lines. But we can see at least that there is this parallel. Now, right. now the thing is, Seventh-day Adventists talk about, you know, the third angel's message of righteousness by faith. And Jones, of course, that's what he's presenting. But he's not just presenting things about, you know, Christ's nature and how to overcome sin. He's always presenting prophecy. <laughs> And prophecy in its present tense, right? Right. He he's he sees that he's he's going over the ground of fulfilled prophecy, and he's not wrong. Because we mark these things, 1888, and the Chicago World's Fair. We mark it, he was doing the same thing we do. Yeah. All right. That's what it looks like. Yeah. And we have to keep do doing that, even though we haven't received the promises, right? We have to, the just shall live by faith. We trust that God is working out his purposes. We can't know what's going to, when things are going to happen. We know what is supposed to happen. But we have a responsibility in giving that message. And so we can see that you can't speak of 
the third angel's message of righteousness by faith if you don't understand the first and second angel's messages. You have to understand that they are also righteousness by faith. But the third angel's message is righteousness by faith in verity, in actuality, worked out in the life. You can't have a third without the first and second. And this isn't understood within Adventism. And even though we give lip service to it in this movement, it's not well understood that the first and second angels' messages are also righteousness by faith. They're just not righteousness by faith in verity, right? Worked out in the life, actually lived. <clears throat> Um, any other questions or any other thoughts? I mean, this, this series, this series of sermons is, is very, very interesting, but you can see where he starts. He it's does. Very, it's very well stated. Yeah. Okay. So. Let's um, close with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this evening and for the time that we had together. Thank you for the Sabbath. May your Holy Spirit uh, be with us throughout this Sabbath. May we be united with Christ and with one another. And we pray for the meeting tomorrow and our responsibility that you've given us and that you specific, specifically have given Dwight. I just pray that... Uh, your angels can use him, that your Holy Spirit can speak to all the hearts and um, that we can obey your voice. Uh, thank you for hearing our prayer. Bring us together again to study your word, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>